Since the 28 C3, there has been at least one capture the flag every year. So the next three speakers that we have are always organizing a capture the flag. They are here representing all their team. Please welcome with a huge round of applause, Andy, Zaelu and Male. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, so, yeah, again, welcome from our side to our talk, uh, What the Flag is CTF? Uh, this talk is going to be a foundation talk, and we want to tell you uh, what a CTF is, uh, how to play it, uh, what game modes there are. Um, this is the first part um, of the talk, a bit of an introduction. And after that, we're going to show you three challenges that we prepared for this year's CTF. So should you actually decide that you want to play a CTF in the future, you uh, know what to expect uh, when you when you actually play it. Um, yeah, so a, f a few words about us. Um, our team is called Eat, Sleep, Pwn, Repeat, or ESPR for short. Uh, we are a CTF team, um, and um, I don't know how long we even exist. It must have been like three or four years now, uh, maybe even five. And um, we are all just people who, in our free time, were interested in IT security. And we got together in hackerspaces or the university. And um, we just started playing CTF. And everybody participated. And that's, well, how a group formed. And uh, now we are eat, sleep, home, repeat. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's all there is to it. Um, I'm always talking about a CTF, but you actually don't know. May maybe you actually don't know what a CTF actually is. So CTF stands for Capture the Flag. And for the older ones of you, this has nothing to do with the Unreal Tournament game mode, um, it's except for the name, and that there are flags. Um, a CTF is a contest between uh, different teams where all the teams solve different challenges um, that are somehow related to the IT security domain. Um, a CTF usually can be played in two main game modes. Of course, there are variations to them, but these are the two modes that you generally have. The first one is the attack and defense style, and the second one is the, is the Jeopardy style. You will see in the next slides uh, what I mean by that. Um, over the years, it's absolutely crazy how the community grew. When we started playing, there were just a handful of CTFs per year. Now, if you check out how many CTFs there are, you can actually play a CTF every weekend. And um, all these CTFs are usually organized by other CTF teams, uh, so there, there's a lot of work by, also done by other teams uh, to organize these, these uh, CTFs. And it's essentially all completely community-driven. And uh, if you want, uh, you can relatively easy be, easily be part of that as well. And that's, that's what the, the goal of this talk is, essentially. Now, I mentioned the Jeopardy-style uh, CTF. That is the, the easiest game mode uh, that, you, that you have. And it's also the easiest to organize, because it it resembles a Jeopardy uh, game, the, the game show, the American game show, where we have different uh, categories of, uh, of puzzles with uh, different um, uh, difficulties. And according to the difficulty, you are awarded a certain amount of points when you solve that challenge. And um, either the uh, amount of points is, is fixed, so you get, I don't know, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 points for a challenge. Uh, according to the difficulty, or uh, nowadays often we have dynamic scoring. So the more people uh, challenge, uh, the, the 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 more often a challenge is solved by people, uh, the less points you're going to get because it's actually relatively hard to uh, uh, to define what your challenge should be worth. And the, to play that game, it's it's actually really easy. You just pick a challenge, you look at it. Uh, you try to solve it, you submit the flag on a web interface somewhere, you get points, and you just repeat that uh, until you solved everything or you are in the first place. Um, and of course, the winner is uh, the team with the most points. If there is a tie, the, uh, the team that got first to that amount of points uh, wins. Uh, the typical categories that you have on a Jeopardy-style CTF are stuff like, for example, Pwn where you have classic binary exploitation. You get some network service somewhere, and you need to connect to that service and do some weird stuff to it to get code execution and run your own programs on that machine that you're, that you're owning. Um, crypto, 
um, custom crypto uh, algorithms that are implemented or uh, crypto algorithms that are used in a wrong way that you need to find out why that is and then you can abuse that uh, to usually decrypt something or uh, uh, recreate a key or whatever. Uh, web, the usual stuff, uh, that's normally, that's, um, that's just web applications um, in all kinds of different frameworks and server side and client side and whatever there all is. Um, or if you're ESPR, we, we had a joke category once, I think, where we uh, put browser exploits in there. Uh, so it's not really web, but uh, that, that was just a, just a joke. And then stuff like reversing, for example, we have to reverse engineer some executable and try to find out what it does and reverse engineer some mathematic uh, uh, calculations and whatever. Um, the next game mode is attack and defense. And that's the more classic mode. Uh, there are just a few per year because it's very hard to organize. Uh, because you hack, in quote marks, real services on real servers on real networks. Because every team gets a virtual machine image which contains, which essentially is a server, which contains uh, services that are specifically crafted for that CTF, where uh, somebody placed bugs in there. And um, all these machines are connected over a VPN, and the teams can reach each other. And the goal is that everybody hacks the service, services of everybody else and steals data from these, from these vulnerable machines. And then you can submit that to a game server, and then you are awarded scores. And of course, if you have full control over the machine, your task is also not only to exploit the other teams, but also to fix your own stuff so that you don't get exploited anymore. So there also, you need to make sure that your services stay up. Because if they are down, uh, usually you don't get any points awarded for flags you steal uh, and stuff like that. So there are three main things you need to do. You need to fix your stuff and remove the bugs. You need to find the bugs and exploit them on other people's machines. And you need to uh, keep everything online. Um, yeah, as I said, the, the main scores there are usually uh, offense, defense, and SLA. That's what I mentioned. Uh, either attack other people's services, uh, defend your own services, and keep them online. Uh, this is usually played in rounds. Every round starts from scratch, and you get points awarded uh, per, per round. And um, after that, uh, all the points are, are added, and the team with the most points wins. There are a few things that are different in every attack and defense CTF in terms of the rules, but that's the general uh, stuff that always happens. This is what a typical scoreboard looks like when you play an attack and defense CTF. This, for example, was from Rue CTFE. And um, yeah, I, I took the one where we were in the first place. And um, you see in the different columns, you see all the services that are available, like, for example, a, a crash, the bin, weather, cr uh, cartographer, and so on. And the um, uh, the, the red and yellow, uh, the red and, and blue um, boxes mean the service is up or is down. You can see how many flags we scored, what the SLA was in percent, so how many uptime versus downtime did we have, how many flags we lost. Uh, that's the, 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 the number in the uh, bottom right corner in every box, like minus 32 for crash. So we lost 32 flags there and we stole 15,000 flags. And then the FP is just the flag points. Yeah, you add everything together, and you get uh, like your, your main score um, and a ranking of the teams. So now that you know how to play a CTF, why even, why even do it? I mean, yeah. So it's relatively obvious. It's pretty cool to play, uh, because you can actually hack stuff uh, completely legally, um, uh, because, well, that's part of the game. Uh, it's fun. It's fun to, to, to learn new stuff, and you learn a lot of new stuff um, uh, during the CTF, but also after the CTF when you talk to other teams and, and try to find out uh, what the solution was and everything. And um, yeah, y you make friends during that. For example, we are uh, um, uh, one of our, 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 our friends is the, the, the Polish team, team Dragon Sector, and every time we meet, uh, we have some beers and we chat about uh, the CTF and everything, and we, we, we actually made, made some good friends there. And um, also, you, you may be able to travel around the world. So uh, CTFs are held locally sometimes, you need to qualify for it, and then you can fly around the world and um, uh, play locally uh, a CTF and maybe even win something. 
So yeah, our CTF that we organized, uh, we, um, we do this as already uh, announced every year since 28 C3. I can see a few logos there from the past years. Um, we always try to match the, uh, the Congress theme. And um, this year, we had uh, in the main CTF, we had 636 teams that at least submitted one flag. Uh, we had a small flag, a uh, small task that we called sanity check, where you just needed to like, paste a, a string into, into the flag uh, box uh, just to see how many teams were online. And yeah, that was 636 teams. We had 30 challenge, and these 636 teams solved them 1,457 times. So 1,457 flags were submitted by all the teams on all the tasks. Uh, we also had a few guest challenges this year, so not all challenges were made by us. So we would like to thank uh, Kokyo, Tetis, uh, Jay Vosin, Kubasa, and Jörnchen um, for, for ideas or even uh, complete challenges that we were able to deploy and had the people uh, solve. And um, the three winners are KGC and Macaroni, uh, Paston on, on uh, uh, the second place, and Dragon Sector on the third. So, uh, yeah, congratulations again to them. Um, yeah. And because every year uh, this, this CTFs got more and more complicated and very hard to solve for beginners, uh, last year we introduced a junior CTF with easier challenges that m more closely matches the difficulty level um, when we started, actually, when, when we started playing CTF. And there we have the, the same stuff. Uh, uh, we, we had 520 teams. So not that much teams, but uh, 33 challenges that we deployed and 2,761 solves in total. So they solved actually more stuff than the main CTFs in terms of raw numbers of challenges. And again, we had some guest, uh, guest, channels, uh, guest challenges by Gehaxel, Dominuk, uh, Prom and uh, Trolldemorted. So thank you. And the winners are um, Mate in MIM. The second place is SNO and the third one is Zenhack. And so now that you know um, what is going on during a CTF, what do you need if you, w if you really want to play? Um, so the first one you need is actually, you need a CTF. Um, there is a cool website that's called ctftime.org. Uh, you can check it out and get um, uh, a listing of all upcoming CTFs. And you can just uh, register uh, on that CTF. And then once it goes live, you can play. In terms of skills, um, you don't need that much. Uh, you, do, you, you actually need to be able to program. Uh, you need to know a scripting language to, to, to do all your dirty work, like if you need to parse a file or if you, I don't know, dissect some network traffic, stuff like that. For reverse engineering and binary exploitation, you absolutely, unfortunately, need to know assembly language and a bit of reverse engineering skills. Uh, to tie all that together, you need the basic Linux shell skills because the, the tools on the Linux are just, well, better suited than on Windows, but you, of course you can on Windows you can just use the, the, window, the Linux subsystem nowadays. It works the same. And um, to, to learn pwning and binary exploitation, you can play so-called war games. On the last slide, there are a few links. You can check them out. Uh, there's one of there. Uh, so the uh, war game is essentially a CTF that's always online. And you can, you can uh, go through it at your own pace without any time restrictions. Uh, you can check out older CTF challenges. There are archives on the internet. You can just download them and run them locally and, and try to exploit them. Um, and um, it has been, um, so there are so-called write-ups by other CTF teams. Sometimes when another CTF team solved a challenge and they thought it was a cool challenge, somebody's going to do a write-up on that and explain in a blog post or whatever uh, how it was solved. So you can read that and learn stuff. If you're more of a video person, there's somebody on YouTube called Life Overflow from the CTF scene, and he's doing awesome videos on uh, s different CTF tasks, and he goes through it, like how he solved it and what the idea behind the challenge was, and so on. And of course, you don't want to play this alone, because it's more fun to do this with other people. And um, just use the internet, try to find a groups, try to find like-minded people, um, or just go to a hackerspace and ask around if somebody's interested. And every now and then you can play a CTF or do the war game stuff and so on, like, just like we did. OK. Now that we explained to you what uh, is going on in, during a CTF, I'd like to hand over to Male, who's going to uh, show you some challenges we had. Okay. 
Hi, um, I'm going to give you an idea how to approach uh, such CDF challenges. And I can highly recommend this book from G. Polya um, on how to solve problems. And as an example, I'll, I took a um, challenge from the junior CDF called Blind. And this is the description, uh, hacking blind and an URL with uh, the path to the flag. And it's estimated as a medium um, difficulty challenge, at least in the junior CDF. And it's based on a bug found by Ripstack in 2017. And approaching a challenge, um, to approach a challenge, it is needed to understand the problem first, right? So when you go to this URL, you are presented with this source code. It's PHP source code, and we're going to walk through it. The first part of the source code is actually a hint. It's not needed to exploit the challenge, but it's hinting to uh, a vulnerability called PHP object injection. And this actually was a bug um, where you could um, include local files until PHP 5.3, but we use PHP 7.2. And the next block is a bit of boilerplate code. So we have two classes called black and green. And what they do is only setting the colors of um, the syntax highlighting. And if you provide a store URL parameter, you can save the theme in a cookie, which comes, uh, which is important for later. So the next section was um, an interesting part because it hints already at the path to exploitation. The first one you get uh, in the first step, you get the theme URL uh, get parameter and store it in this uh, variable. In the next slide, uh, in, the, in the next line, you check if it's either the black class name or the green class name. Then you check if this class actually exists. Um, you set the variables depending on the input in the, uh, from the URL parameters. And this is the interesting part. Now you um, instantiate an object of the given class. Um, which could either be black or green. And you have full control over the parameters you give to the constructor of this class. Um, the next part of the code was also um, storing the theme, but this time from the cookie. And then you check if the first part of the cookie is an existing class. Then, sorry. Then um, you pass the parameters which are stored in the cookie to this uh, to the constructor of the class, and you instantiate an object of that class. And the last part is just giving you some info what modules are loaded. So the bug was simply that you could instantiate an arbitrary PHP object, and you control the arguments for its constructor. So the next step is to make a plan. Um, so we try to um, get together all the things we, we have given and what we want to do. So we have fully control over the data in the cookie. And we can instantiate a PHP ob object of an existing class. And we control the arguments. So what we have to do now is we have to find a class which does nice things like reading a file when giving uh, specific arguments. And there's this handy class called simple XML element, um, which is able to read files, XML files from a remote source. Uh, if you set the option to two, um, you it will even substitute entities in the XML file. So this will come, uh, this will be important later. And now we have to carry out the plan. This is the easy exploit. 
um, we set a cookie called theme. The first part of the cookie is our class name, simple XML element, and the second part is the path to the flag. And as you can see, the flag is, con uh, is, is printed in the warnings right there. So this only works because warnings were enabled. So the next thing you do when uh, solving problems is looking back and what, what, uh, how could we approach the challenge in a different way or with different constraints. And if the warnings weren't en enabled, we were kind of blind. That's where the, the challenge name comes from. And we don't get output. And with XML, you can include external entities. And it works like that. You declare an entity and give it a, a path name. And then you, uh, yeah, you include it in the XML. And this is how you could exploit it. So you, you get a second XML file from your own server, which uh, is at the bottom of the slides. And it gets the flag and sends its contents to your own server. So when you execute a simple exploit like this, you start a PHP server, and then you, you call uh, this URL with curl, you get presented with a request that looks like that. And because we uh, encoded the flag with base64, we have to decode it, and then you get the flag this way. So next part is for the main CTF by Saelo. Yeah, thank you. you. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, thanks. So now you just saw uh, an example of a rather typical web CTF challenge. Um, now by now we, we have a lot of teams that are really, really skilled. Um, they have been playing CTF for many years. They do computer security as their day-to-day -day job. Um, and so of course we also want to make very challenging uh, and interesting ch uh, CTF for these teams, right? Um, and so one thing we do is we try to make somewhat realistic challenges based on real-world software and vulnerabilities. Um, so yeah, on this slide you see some logos of, of software that we base challenges on in, in some way for this CTF here. Um, now one fun fact, uh, we actually this time had three different teams use zero days <laughs> uh, to, to, instead of solving the challenge in the intended way, they used zero days for the software which is fair game. Uh, yeah, I don't know what that says about our CDF, but it's pretty interesting. Um, and so what I want to do now is just uh, or we'll present two of these challenges. Uh, I'm going to present a browser exploitation challenge a little bit um, and talk a bit about this, the setup, how to host such a challenge, uh, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so we had browser exploitation challenges the last two years already. Um, now. For some years now, a browser is, uh, they come with a sandbox, right? So if you just have one vulnerability in the rendering stuff where it renders the HTML, um, that's not enough to fully compromise the browser. Um, the last years, we only had the rendering exploit part, so the real browser stuff, but no sandbox. Now this year, we decided we should do uh, a full, like a real browser exploit challenge with two parts. One part is the, the rendering exploit, the, the WebKit in this, uh, in this, this time, um, and the other part is the sandbox escape. Um, and we based that off of yeah, real uh, exploit chains that were presented this year or last year. Um, so how do, you, how do you make such a, a browser challenge? What, what we did um, is we, we took WebKit this time. Uh, last year we had Chrome and the year before Firefox. So this year we used WebKit, which uh, is the, the browser engine powering Safari, for example. Um, and we changed, we, we implemented some, some buggy optimization somewhere in the JavaScript part. Um, so this is the first thing. that There's one vulnerability there in the WebKit. Uh, the next thing we did, uh, we wrote some, some macOS system services 
um, yeah, again, kind of based on real vulnerabilities that were presented this year. Um, and, and so they were, of course, also buggy in some way. They had some vulnerabilities. Um, and then we deployed both the modified Safari and those system services to a macOS virtual machine. Um, and so then what users can do is they get on the top right here, you see that they get a website um, where they can submit a URL to their exploit, right? So it's a browser exploit. So the exploit is going to be some web page. Um, they can um, here type in their, the, the URL for their exploit. Uh, and then what happens is on our servers, uh, it will boot up a, the, this virtual machine, um, open Safari with that URL. And then the users will get back um, a video of, of that virtual machine booting up. Um, and then the goal or the task here is to read slash flag uh, or slash flag.txt, so some file on the file system. Um, and so they, th what they could do is they could display it on the screen, and so then they would see it in the video. Um, so yeah, here's pretty much how it looked like from a player's perspective. Uh, what they would do for this challenge is they would get from us um, a WebKit patch and those macOS services as binaries, so they would have to reverse engineer them. Um, so then they go and audit for vulnerabilities, hopefully find some, um, and they would write exploits. So in this case, it's, it's a malicious website. Um, they will host that on some server that they control uh, with a public IP address, and then submit this URL to, um, to our yeah, uh, scoreboard servicing. Um, and then again, that boots up this virtual machine, records the video, and shows the video to the players. So here's how it looks like. Uh, I hope it works. Yes. Um, so this is exactly what the players would get after typing in uh, the URL into the scoreboard. Um, so they would get this video feed. So let's see what happened here. Um, yeah, in the background, you see the, the, the modified Safari, uh, which is opening the player's URL. Um, and it's printing some stuff from the exploit, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then it, so it does a WebKit exploit, so it can now run uh, attacker's code in the WebKit process. And then it's exploiting these system services that we wrote, which are running outside of the sandbox. And so then it can open uh, or run any commands outside of the sandbox on the system. So in this case, the exploit starts uh, this text editor app uh, and lets it open slash flag.txt. And it's probably pretty small, but in the top left, you can see there it's uh, showing you the flag. And now you have to type this into the scoreboard, and then you get your points. Um, yeah, so, so why, why, is this, uh, why do we think this is a nice challenge? Um, or why, why do you want to solve this? Of course, I mean, this gives you lots of points for the CTF. This is actually not one challenge, but three challenges. Um, so we made it so that you could solve the sandbox escape part, uh, regardless of whether you had this WebKit exploit working. Um, so there was, was one flag that you got if you only had the, the WebKit, the, the saf uh, Safari part. There was one other flag that you get if you only have the sandbox escape. And then there's a third flag if you have both and you combine them into a single exploit. Yeah, then you get the third flag. Um, but yeah, apart from CTF, so we try to also make these challenges um, so that you may, uh, are able to learn something new, maybe, right? So the WebKit part, uh, it, it could hopefully teach you, or hopefully you would learn a little bit more about JavaScript or just-in-time compiler uh, vulnerabilities on the path to solving that. Um, or the macOS services, yeah, we made them so that it's, it gives you an easy entry into macOS security, right? So this is yeah, something to keep in mind. Um, we will release source code. So for this challenge here, it's going to be up in uh, some hours probably on, on my GitHub. Um, and then, yeah, it, it, uh, it tries to make it easy to transition from the CTF and maybe go to the real world security scene um, with challenges like these that give, yeah, with source code, give you a nice entry. Um, yeah, and that's it from me. And next up is Andy again. Thank you. Yeah. I also did a challenge or two, and um, those, are you, uh, th those of you who are old enough, you're going to remember this phone, right? So the story behind my challenge was that I 
uh, privately was interested in GSM stuff, and I just wanted to know how stuff works and so on. So s I set up a GSM network at home with a software-defined radio and everything, and used old Nokia phones and so on. And then I got an idea. Um, I built my own phone. Uh, what you can see here is uh, part of the challenge. You can see that I re-implemented the UI of a Nokia phone, essentially, and it logs onto a, a GSM network, uh, which is not using radio waves, but um, the, the GSM traffic is um, sent over uh, UDP multicast traffic in the uh, core network, and uh, then I also have like my SDR on there so that my own phone can talk to the real phone. That's what you just saw. And um, I found this, this, this feature of that challenge where you don't have radio waves for communication with the GSM uh, network is usually used for unit tests by the developers of the, of the network services to run your own uh, GSM network because they don't want to mess with radios and everything just to test their software. So they implemented like this, this um, uh, Ethernet layer to uh, do GSM. And that was perfect for um, a CTF challenge because we don't, have, we don't only have local players. Uh, so in theory, I could just set up a few SDRs and transmit my own uh, uh, GSM network um, if you uh, have the right licenses. And so to, uh, to, to do so uh, in the RF spectrum, uh, that being another issue, but uh, you, in theory you could do that, but somebody from the US or um, wherever else is not able to participate in the challenge. And we, we always want to have uh, the p capability for remote players to play as well. So I set up an open VPN tunnel, essentially, where the network lives in, and your own phone, uh, this, this target phone that you could exploit, I just then uh, joined the network using this uh, this this. Um, this UDP multicast stuff. So that was absolutely perfect for that. So what I implemented actually is a bug in concatenated SMS. The phone only has two features. It can send SMS and it can, it can receive SMS. And your task was uh, to uh, uh, have a phone somewhere on the network that you can only interact with over the network. So you can only send it SMS, essentially. And, um, but you can send it arbitrary SMS. You can send whatever you want. You can adhere to the standard, but you can also send whatever you want and not adhere to, adhere to the standard and do weird stuff. And um, on the old Nokia phones, on the, on the later ones, uh, SMS only have 160 characters, and on the later Nokia phones, you had this thing on the right where it told you how many uh, characters you have left for the SMS, and then a slash, and then how many SMS you already uh, wrote, essentially. Because what it would do, it would split, uh, is it would split the SMS mes message apart every few hundred characters, and then put a header in front of the SMS, send one, two, or three SMS to the other phone, and then the other phone would start to reassemble these SMS once they all arrive. And um, yeah, so in, in this case, the SMS can be split up into up to three parts, but the standard allows up to 254 SMS, actually. Um, so, and all these SMS contain some data, as I said, in front in the header, and they um, also contain an index what part that actually is. And it starts from one and it goes up to 254. In this case, you can, well, use one, two, or three. And um, the SMS content that I'm going to reassemble is somewhere in a local stack buffer. And the location where the decoded text from, the, from that one SMS part is copied to when reassembled is based on the number uh, of the part of that SMS. And I, in, in my challenge, I'm never checking if that number is actually one, two, or three. So you can set it to four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, and you would write outside of that buffer. And because that buffer is on a stack, the way how um, uh, uh, processes work is they save some information on the stack to keep track of where they were before they called a function to return that location once they are done with certain tasks. And you can override that value and hijack the control flow. Um, and um, then use a technique called ROP um, to gain uh, code execution on the phone and execute some, some code there. Much like uh, Zaelo showed with the, with the browser where you open the text editor, you can um, connect uh, to another host and get a Linux shell essentially on the phone and then you can open the flag. Um, 
With that, um, that's, that, that was the talk. I would like to thank the whole CTF community, uh, the, the players that played our CTF, uh, other teams that organized the CTFs, um, and, and everybody in the CTF community for like being that cool and putting that much effort into uh, not only playing our CTF, but also organizing CTFs for us to play. And um, another, I, I also want to thank the assembly team here at the C3 because it, we got our own area this year where uh, all the CTF teams that were locally uh, could gather around and it was absolutely perfect. It looked so cool seeing like 200 hackers sitting on the tables in a space together and just solving our challenges. It, it was absolutely amazing. And uh, yeah, thanks again to uh, our, our guest authors for the challenges. And um, yeah, we would be open for questions and answers now. <laughs> oh, and um, one, one other thing. Uh, if you are interested in playing CTF, uh, here are a few links with the resources uh, that I mentioned earlier. Check them out. Uh, this is Wargame, is CTF time, and it's Life Overflow's um, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, check it out if you're interested. And uh, yeah, we hope uh, that you're a part of the CTF uh, community soon, maybe. <laughs> you Thank you very much also from my side. I can already see that there are some questions in the audience. So I would like to start with microphone number two. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, Actually, my university security course was a, a graded CTF. We got the grades based on our points on the CTF. What are your opinions about this kind of grading? How do you feel about university learning places doing CTFs for grades? I mean, for, for us, it's, it's, it's a hobby, and uh, f also for us, it's a, it was a great way, way to learn new things. So I'm personally not completely opposed to that. I don't know if I would uh, maybe make uh, uh, the grading dependent on, on the points, uh, but I think it's a, it's a great thing to do just as a learning experience. So no matter if that's on a university or if you do it in a private life, uh, you, if, you, if, you, if you just play, you're always like we we also when we solve some challenges from other teams we always we are always learning new tricks new stuff and so on so i i don't think it's a bad idea thank you for that question the next question is coming from microphone 3 over there what do you do when you are stuck on a, on a ta the task oh good question mm -hmm. um, often it helps to get somebody else from the team just take a break and um, go with somebody who is completely unaware of what the challenge looked like through your findings and just talk about the challenge. Either the other person still has some more ideas to try, even though that person might have never looked at the challenge, or you are reiterating everything that you have done over the last few hours to s by, by just explaining it to somebody else. And maybe then you get another idea where to look out uh, or, I don't know, just start Googling stuff. Maybe, maybe there was a similar bug in, in some other software. There, there are multiple uh, things to do. But it also happens a lot of times that we are not able to solve a challenge. Uh, so CTA, playing CTF can actually also be tr frustrating because you're sitting for 12 hours on a challenge and you just can't make this thing work. And you, you, you have no idea how to solve it. That happens as well, because ju you, you're just missing a trick. But what you then do afterwards is you, you ask other teams. You ask in the IRC channels uh, of, the, of the CTF you, uh, how that was solved. You uh, ask for write-ups. You read the write-ups. Uh, you ask other people from the team when you, uh, when you see each other next time in person, for example, here at the Congress, and so on. And that's how you gain more and more knowledge and experience over time. And, uh, uh, learn your stuff. We can take one more question. There is someone waiting at microphone number two again. Hi. Uh, first of all, I think, is this working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. First of all, thank you very much for hosting the CDF. It's uh, highly appreciated also that you're doing browser exploitation challenges, given that it's really hard to set them up and host them for everyone. Uh, my question is, what's your take on, um, on having people solve challenges in real-world software that you didn't modify? As in, like, disc implicitly disclosing bugs in, in software. Um, I'm not sure if I got the question. So you mean pe uh, people using zero days for solving our challenge, is it? Days. No, we, we are not. I mean, all the challenges had modifications that 
So they had an intended solution that's not an ODE. Um, it's it's real world challenges, right? So it doesn't really get more real world than using an ODE. So we are not against that, except if it's against challenge infrastructure, which is which is not the case here. Uh, so it's fair game for us. Um, I guess the, the the players they trust us, and they trust that nothing happens to their ODEs. <laughs> so that's why they do it, um, or some of them. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, also I think I think we can all agree that even if we have an ODA, it's still a, the right thing to do would still be to responsibly disclose and not put it out on the internet to put other people in danger. I mean that's that's just, I mean, I never saw that actually happen during a CTF that that there was some some leaked ODA that suddenly got in the wild and um, and 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 endangered like normal users. That so far this never happened, and let's hope that stays that way. I mean it would be bad if it if it would happen. You're right. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, the time for our question and answer is over, but I'm pretty sure the speakers will answer all your other questions after the talk. Please give a large round of applause for Andy, Male, and Saelo. Thank you.